All right, here we go. As promised, my sermon this morning is entitled, Would Jesus Wear a Mask? Would, would Jesus Wear a Mask? And I guess it's a question that is even uh, more appropriate uh, today than it would have been when I was originally going to preach it last Sunday, given the Minnesota mask mandate that has come out just a few days ago. Uh, I'm going to start by repeating a couple things I said last week. I'm, I'm actually not intending to answer that question in my sermon, would Jesus wear a mask? It would be uh, perhaps inappropriate of me to assume that I could figure out exactly what Jesus would do if he were living in Minnesota on July 26th of 2020. So I'm not going to attempt that. What I am going to attempt today is to look together with you at some of the science out there on uh, mask wearing We'll try to, I'll try to present the arguments for and against wearing masks, ponder those things a bit. And then, um, as I said last week, of, of far more importance, uh, we'll also look today at some biblical principles and values that I think we uh, can look to in order to help us navigate all these issues that the coronavirus has brought to our lives. Um, it's, again, my, my deep hope and intention not to allow differences of opinion on masks to cause any sort of rift in my relationship with anybody here or between you and, and Calvary. Uh, people do have different opinions and, and thoughts on this stuff, so I'm just going to put the information out there and these principles out there, and, you know, it's up to you to, to determine um, how that will affect your, your, your life, which... I guess it's probably the case every Sunday, right? So, um, so that's our task for the morning. Let's get into it. Well, it would be certainly a mistake to do a sermon on this topic without taking a moment uh, to acknowledge um, the tremendous toll that coronavirus has taken upon the world. Uh, the internet will tell you today that something like 132,000 Americans have lost their lives to this virus in the last five and a half months. If you uh, widen out to the whole world, that number grows to 641,000. And I, I'm aware that some people question the accuracy of those uh, reports, those numbers, um, but you know, hey, the truth is somewhere out there in the hundreds of thousands, uh, right? So we, we know that people are dying all over the world from, from this virus or getting very, very sick. And, and so um, we need to take a moment here uh, amongst our academic discussion of all of these things to, to just to pause and remember uh, these folks who have lost their lives and, and uh, their loved ones who have had to watch their spouses uh, or parents pass away and so forth. We also ought to acknowledge the, the toll that the virus has taken on our world indirectly, right? Through the, uh, the shutdowns and uh, all the social distancing. So an emotional toll, uh, an economic toll, a mental health toll, right? Uh, potentially a spiritual health toll. That's been huge. So uh, this stuff has hit many, many people right in the gut. And um, we need to acknowledge that too. One of the biblical values that I think we ought to uh, mention in a sermon on this topic we're tackling today is the biblical teaching that God followers are to be people of truth. We're to be people of truth. Our, our look at biblical values this morning is mostly going to come in the, the last 25% of my sermon, but I, I want to use this call to be people of truth uh, as the foundation for the first 75% of my sermon. We could start out with the ninth of the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, which told us, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Tell the truth. And uh, then we could go over to the proclamation from Paul, who said we should stand firm then with the belt of truth, buckle around our waists and the breastplate of righteousness in place, and so on. Be people of truth. Uh, 1 John 3.18, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to bring truth, and so we then too are asked to rejoice with the truth. So, uh, since we're charged with being uh, people of truth, we, we do need to put some effort in to work to uh, ferret out what truth is to the best of our ability and then live according to it. Seems to get a little more difficult all the time in our society today where everything is questioned. 
uh, and, and where we know um, it seems many people are, are very willing to say mistruths to accomplish their, their purposes. Uh, but I don't think that the effort is hopeless. The truth is out there, and, uh, and, and I do believe, um, most of the time, I believe that we can still find it if we're committed uh, to living by the truth. So we need to be careful not to uh, fall into uh, deceptions, you know. We, we ought to stay away from believing claims and advancing them that seem to have no basis in evidence. We need to be committed to the truth. To that end then, I would like us to look now at the information surrounding this uh, matter of wearing masks as a way to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Some people say masks work, some people say they don't. What's the truth? What can, what can we learn of it? So yeah, I've done some of the homework for you over the last couple of weeks and uh, you, know, you jump on the internet and you can find all kinds of uh, studies, scientific studies on the effectiveness of face masks to read. It's really fun. And let me tell you what I found out. The conclusions of all the studies I looked at on this subject were very mixed. Very mixed. I'll take you on a brief tour. You already know that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, says that masks can help help stop the spread of the virus. Uh, Not so much from keeping the wearer of the mask safe, but by catching some of the droplets that come out of our mouths, right? That come out of the wearer's mouth uh, when they speak, sing, cough, sneeze, whatever. We've all heard by now, coronavirus spreads most effectively through those droplets, whether they're big enough that you can see them or whether they're so small that we can't see them. A book called Molecular Biology of the Cell, which I did not read, (laughs) says... That a person suffering from the common cold can launch 20,000 droplets containing that cold virus into the air each time they sneeze. This is how viruses spread. So CDC believes that masks uh, can stop some of those droplets from getting out. And so they say that's a better situation than just letting them all fly. (laughs) To support their position... They reference a number of scientific studies. And before I start in on these, um, you need to know that almost all the mask studies that people have looked at in these debates have been researching the impact of face masks on the spread of the influenza virus or rhinovirus. Remember coronavirus? This one is brand new. So there aren't studies we can just go back to and and look at. Uh, So people have looked at viruses that spread in similar ways to the coronavirus and then looked to see how masks have impacted the spread of those viruses. So one of the scientific studies the CDC uses to back up its claims about masks was put out on August of 2013 by a group of scientists who wanted to test the effectiveness of homemade masks just in case there was an influenza pandemic someday. I'm not going to spend time Uh, this morning describing the experiments and the tests uh, that were run in any of these studies. We're just going to go right to the conclusions of the researchers, okay? Well, the conclusion from this particular study was that both homemade masks and surgical masks, and these are surgical masks, the ones we have for you in case you forget uh, to bring one. They're also called medical masks. Uh, The researchers wrote that both masks significantly reduced the number of microorganisms expelled by volunteers in the study, although the surgical mask was three times more effective in blocking transmission than the homemade mask. And then they ended their study by saying, our findings suggest that a homemade mask should be considered as a last resort to prevent droplet transmission from infected individuals, but it would be better than no protection. Another uh, study that the CDC referenced from April of this year claims in their work that N95 masks, so these would be the real specialty masks, they blocked nearly all of a mock virus that this study had produced. And medical masks blocked approximately 97% of the virus. Homemade masks blocked approximately 95% of the virus. That's very high effectiveness numbers in that study. I should also point out that in all these studies we're going to be looking at today, the authors are quite quick to say that the effectiveness of homemade masks will vary depending on how they're made, what they're made out of, how they're worn, 
how well fitting they are, and if they are cleaned regularly. So lots of variables going on with homemade masks. CDC lists, uh, lists five other studies there in support of their claim of the effectiveness of masks, and all of them say, to some degree, masks are effective. Surgical masks are more effective than homemade masks. Most of the homemade mask numbers were not nearly as high as that 95% in, in the one study that I just mentioned. What's interesting here is that in May of this past year, just three months ago, the same CDC published, published an article that looked at 14 different studies on masks that have been con conducted over time. And the conclusion of that article was, we did not find evidence that surgical type ma face masks are effective in reducing lab confirmed influenza transmission, either when worn by infected persons or by persons in the general community to reduce their susceptibility. Oh boy. Yeah, here we go. I found a study from this past April that said that masks provided no reduction of influenza-like illness cases or influenza in the general population or in healthcare workers. There was insufficient evidence to provide a recommendation on the use of facial barriers without other measures. And then on the other side, Fox News wrote an article that cited a June 16 study that said that while masks are imperfect, they do decrease the droplet, the droplet accumulation of a person during repeated cough cycles. Uh, that study explained that droplets of saliva can travel 18 feet in five seconds when an unmasked person coughs. So masks are important, they say. That means I can still get you from up here. And then back to the other side. Professor and researcher Dennis Rancourt wrote an article also from this last April in which he made the argument that, okay, since, since masks are only partially able to block droplets coming out of people's mouths, stuff is going out. And since we know the masks don't protect the wearer, then the stuff that got out from that other person's mask is going to get in to, the nearby, to a nearby person's masks. Therefore, he believes the whole mask prevention step is not worthwhile. But back to the other side. Fox News brings to us another article, and I have to tell you, I was expecting Fox News to route me to uh, articles that were skeptical of masks, but that was not typically the case. This article was from just two and a half weeks ago, July 9, and it referenced a recent study, and this study was done on the actual coronavirus in which masks actually reduced infection rates in the wearers by 65%, in the wearers. And finally, I'll bring you to the study that Governor Walls uh, cited in his press conference this past week uh, in explaining his decision to implement a mask mandate. Uh, this study was of a different sort. It was dated June 16 of this year. These researchers looked at uh, coronavirus infection numbers in states that had face mask mandates in place between April 8 and May 5. There were 15 of them. They compared the infection rates in those states during that time frame to what had been happening in those same states prior to the mask mandate. They found that the overall infection rates in those states decreased 0.9% in the first five days, 1.1% in the second five days after the mandate began. 1.4% in the third five-day period, and then one7 and finally 2.0% in the final five-day period studied. They noted that while those numbers appear to be small, when you multiply them by the number of people actually living in 15 states, you're talking about an overall decrease estimate of between 230,000 to 450,000 cases of infection. So not insignificant. They also compared those declines in infection rates to states that did not have face mask mandates during those weeks, and they wrote in their conclusion, the study provides evidence that states in the U.S. mandating use of face masks in public had a greater decline in daily COVID-19 growth rates after issuing, the man after issuing the mandates compared to states that did not issue mandates. Okay, let's breathe for a moment. Breathe into your masks. Well, this has just cleared it all up for you, hasn't it? <laughs> What's the truth on masks? 
What a mixed group of results that was. I'd say the truth is that there's nothing definitive yet. That we're still learning what masks do on uh, how they affect coronavirus. I don't really have, you know, I don't have any reason to um, doubt that these scientists, at least most of them, were genuinely trying to seek the truth in their studies, but they were coming up with different results. So, you know, I don't know what you're going to do with this information. It seems like both sides have studies that they can point to, uh, to, to, to prove their point. We, we probably should just take a moment to, to note that uh, the medical community, both the researchers and the practitioners, as well as all the infectious disease uh, uh, experts, have become pretty well unified in their interpretation of all of this data. Uh, so the people whose job it is to help us battle disease are all telling us to wear masks. Now, that doesn't mean that a very large group of people can't get something wrong. They're, I'm sure we could find all kinds of examples of that in history, right? Um, but this, is, this probably should count for something, that all of these people are saying the same thing. Mayo Clinic, U of M, John Hopkins, wherever you go, they're going to tell us to wear masks. So this is our attempt at finding truth uh, because we are called to be people committed to truth and on this mask matter, the result is a little bit muddled, isn't it? Well, before we get into the biblical values that I want to look at today, uh, maybe we should just comment briefly on a couple of other, couple of other coronavirus-related controversies. Again, as a part of our effort to look for truth. I had written a little section on uh, the effectiveness of social distancing, but for the sake of time, I'm just not, not going to go into that. It's really not all that controversial. Everyone knows if we never leave our houses, we're not going to get infected, right? And if you're standing uh, right in the spit zone of somebody who's sick, you probably are going to get infected. You know? And there's some <laughs> risk uh, decreases or increases based on where you're standing, I guess. I, I think that we all had a teacher or... Uh, Maybe a, a pastor or someone we heard speaking who had that little trouble with regular spit going out when they were presenting. You didn't want to sit in the front row. <laughs> so stay out of the spit zone. Now there has, however, been a great deal of noise about the inconsistency in the social distancing orders coming from the government. Uh, who can be open? Who can't? How many people can go into one place versus another? And, you know, I agree that stuff has been frustrating, at times really frustrating. But does inconsistent application of a plan mean that the goal of the plan was wrong? I don't think so. You know, so assuming that the social distancing goal is a good one, then uh, we probably shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater in that one. Hey, we never said anything about whether just wearing a mask can make you sick. You hear that too, right? Can just wearing the mask make you sick? I'll admit I didn't do a ton of research on this one, uh, but in the little that I did do, I only found one study that suggested that people might get sick from a mask due to moisture retention and uh, reuse. Uh, I'm assuming that means that they weren't washing their cloth masks. Um, so there's, uh, there was no data given there, it was just a suggestion. On the contrary, I did find infectious disease expert Davidson Manor from Boston University saying that there, there's no evidence that the use of masks causes fungal or bacterial infections. Disposable face masks are meant to be used once, then thrown in the garbage. With cloth masks, it's a good idea to wash them regularly. Uh, Vanderbilt University's website posted on this topic recently as well, and they said, uh, prolonged use of any face mask has not been shown to cause carbon dioxide toxicity or lack of adequate oxygen in healthy people. Remember, there are healthcare workers who routinely wear masks for prolonged periods as part of usual care, like performing surgery, and adverse effects from this practice have not been reported. How about one last controversy just to think through just a little bit before we get to our biblical values? Is it all worth it? The social distancing, the mask wearing, the shutdowns of schools and business, has all of that been worth it? That's a big question, right? You know, I read more than one article this week that 
from, that said that from an economic standpoint, saving the lives of so many people will actually have achieved a greater economic benefit than the size of the economic loss that we suffered from the shutdowns. And of course they say, obviously it would have been best if the coronavirus hadn't come and we hadn't had any sort of, uh, or hadn't had to deal with that at all. Um, but given the options, economists say that the shutdowns were worth it. I don't really understand that, but I guess I'll just trust the economists on that one. But what, what about the costs we mentioned earlier, the, the um, emotional costs, the mental health costs? Maybe the overall economy is better off by having done the shutdowns, but we know that many, many people have lost their livelihoods. So economics not so good for them. Was saving all the lives uh, through the shutdowns worth those costs that have been paid? Well, man, how do you measure that stuff? <laughs> and, and even if you could measure it, how would you choose which cost to pay? Should we have reopened long ago and just let the coronavirus do what it's going to do? Have we just delayed getting our country to the herd immunity point that we need to get to? Mayo Clinic says that to get to herd immunity, about 70% of the United States would have to become infected and then recover. And they say that this amount of infection uh, could lead to serious complications and millions of deaths. All right, on this point, I'll, I'll, I'll get personal and tell you just what I think on this one. Herd immunity is obviously a great goal, and we do need to get there. But let me ask you, are you willing to sacrifice your dad or mom or have complications from your kids getting this illness or sacrifice your grandma in order to help the United States get to herd immunity more quickly? I've got a mom who has diabetes and has struggled with breathing and asthma all of her life. She's in her mid-70s. Tell you what, I've got motivation for a very slow spread of the coronavirus in my life. When I think of my mom and my kids and my wife, I can tell you that if they have to get sick with this at some point, I would rather have it be later than sooner. Because the farther, the longer we go, the doctors are going to start figuring out how to treat this and we're going to get closer to a vaccine. So I'd rather have it be later than sooner. And so, yeah, theoretically, you know, we could argue that on the macro level, it might be best to get to herd immunity more quickly. But uh, I don't know about you. I, I guess I'm just not willing to sacrifice my loved ones to get us to herd immunity quickly. The cost of shutting down businesses and schools is huge. It's terrible. And we all know that we have to continue marching towards getting back to normal. Uh, we just can't live like this for long. But I am in favor of slow and steady return rather than a quick one because I love my kids, my wife, and my mom, etc. It's my personal feeling on it. <laughs> All right, it's finally time to move into our look at some other biblical values that I would suggest we all should be considering when it comes to coronavirus and these things. We are not only to be people committed to truth. There are some other things God has asked of us. Uh, one thing changed between last week when I was going to preach this sermon and this week. <laughs> Pretty big one. We got a mask mandate. Last week, masks were just highly recommended. This week, they're required in public settings. So that is effectively a, a law right now. You can be charged with a petty misdemeanor if you don't comply. Now, you may believe that the governor overstepped his uh, authority to issue that law, but, you know, that, that's a matter for courts to decide. In the meantime, this is the directive, and, and it functions as law. So that leads us into a look at the biblical value of submission to governing authorities. Submission to governing authorities. Here's Romans 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. This is why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone that, what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. 
And many people have pointed out that the Apostle Paul wrote that passage when the Romans were the authorities in his land. And the Romans weren't asking people, their people to wear face masks. They were killing Christians. And yet Paul wrote, Submit, be respectful, show honor. Then there's uh, Titus 3.1 where Paul instructed Titus to remind the people in the church to be submissive to rulers and the authorities to be obedient. 1 Peter 2. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Is there ever a time for civil disobedience for Christians? Absolutely. Uh, Peter and the apostles disobeyed the rulers who had told them to stop teaching about Jesus. And they said to those rulers, we must obey God rather than human beings. But again, those rulers were telling them not to teach about Jesus, and that was a direct uh, contradiction to God's command. So in that circumstance, we obey God. Is a government order to wear a face mask in public gatherings an order that goes directly against one of God's commands? This ties right into our next biblical value that we ought to be thinking about. It's the command to be humble. To be humble. Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility... Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Colossians 3 says, As God's chosen people, holy dearly, and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So pride is not a godly value. Humility is. Next biblical value to be thinking about. Care for others. Love for others. We just read a good verse on that one. Philippians 2. In humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So, if wearing a mask really does protect the people around you rather than yourself, and we saw that the, you know, the evidence on that was mixed, but if it does, then wouldn't wearing a face mask be right in line with that Bible verse? Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. That fits. You know the biblical value of caring for others. I don't have to teach you that. You you know Jesus asked us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Last one uh, that comes to my mind anyway. We're called to be people of peace. People of peace, both to have peace within us and also to seek to achieve peace around us. Galatians 5 uh, says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so on. Actually, there are some other biblical values on that list that probably apply to our discussion here today too. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. The world is angry right now. Everybody's angry, right? Does the face mask thing make you angry? Why? (laughs) Have you asked yourself why? Why does it make you angry? Jesus calls us to peace. James 1.19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Back in 2015, I did a sermon for you on what qualifies as righteous anger, which would be the only kind of anger that would be biblically sanctioned, right? And we used some definitions in that sermon that I borrowed from a Christian author named Robert Jones. Uh, And I'm going to throw those just back up on, on the board for you again today. What is righteous anger was the question. Jones said that righteous anger reacts against actual sin. He said righteous anger does not result from merely being inconvenienced 
or from violations of personal preference or human tradition. Number two, Joan said, righteous anger focuses on God and his kingdom rights and concerns, not on me and my kingdom rights and concerns. And point number three from Jones in that sermon was, righteous anger is accompanied by other godly qualities and expresses itself in godly ways. Righteous anger remains self-controlled. It keeps its head without cursing, screaming, flying off the handle. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they will be called the children of God. Well, these are the biblical values uh, that I've been thinking we all ought to be considering in these days. The Bible calls us to be people of truth. We're to submit ourselves to the governing authorities. We're called to humility rather than pride. We're called to care for others. And we're called to be people of peace rather than anger. So that's what I've got for you today. What do you think? Uh, Please don't answer out loud. (laughs) I didn't mean what do you think of the sermon. I meant what do you think of this question? (laughs) Would Jesus wear a mask? Don't answer that one out loud. That's what I meant there. Would Jesus wear a mask? What do you think that Jesus would do in regards to all of these matters if he were sitting right here today? I would suggest... You seek to duplicate that. Would you bow in prayer with me? Lord, we ask for wisdom. This stuff is not easy. We ask for wisdom. That our thoughts and behaviors would be in line with your will and your thinking. May you guide us into unity as a church body in in these matters through the leading of your Holy Spirit as you teach us and lead us. And of course, we do pray for this current situation to change so that we can get back to living in the way that human beings were intended to live, uh, being able to freely interact with our fellow humans without barriers of masks or six feet spaces. We pray that you'd be with those who are sick today and those who are suffering some of these other costs we've been speaking about. Protect our families, Lord, and our community. Protect our church family uh, from this virus, we pray. And we do pray all of these things in the wonderful name of Jesus, who is our Lord. Amen.